All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Thank you so much for being here. We're here today with Dr. David Billard, um, myself, Naomi Hoffer, Alexa Greenstein. Uh, just really delighted to have you here with us today, whether you're watching us live right now with us or you're listening to this at a later time as a recording. We're delighted to have you here. As I mentioned, my name is Naomi Hoffer. I'm the program manager for the Sherry Sobrato Bryson Brain Cancer Survivorship Program. And um, Alexa Greenstein, do you want to say hello, Alexa? Hi, everyone. Welcome tonight. I'm very excited to speak with all of you guys. I work closely with Naomi Hoffer in the Brain Tumor Survivorship Program. And David Villard is our featured speaker. I'll introduce him more formally, but you wanted to say hello, David? Yeah, I'd love to say hello to everybody. And we're three of us are really enjoying uh, this opportunity to talk with you. And as we get going, I like this um, notion that all learning is group learning. And so there's no experts on this side of things. And we're all expert about ourselves to a degree. But we hope to explore some things that will be helpful to you today. Yeah. And well, helpful to us too. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Um, so I would love to start off with just a, a, a short grounding meditation. I know that in our busy lives, we don't often take, a, take time for ourselves just to allow ourselves to arrive where we are. So if you'll join me in just getting comfortable, uh, if, you're, if it's comfortable for you to close your eyes, you can let your eyes gently float shut, unless of course you're driving a motor vehicle. Um, make sure that you're safe and just Take a couple of moments to feel your body in the chair. You might feel the feet on the floor. Allow yourself to feel supported in this moment, in this space and time. And let yourself fully arrive right now. With a couple deep breaths in, you might feel the air coming in your body. And as you release it, just see if you can sink a little deeper, letting go of any tension that you might be holding. Shedding some of your previous experiences or future worries to just allow yourself to be here now. And just with the next few breaths, I invite you to ask yourself silently, what brings me here today? What brings me here to this webinar on relationships? What do I hope to share or get out of it or learn? An image might come to you, either you might get a verbal response in your body or an image that comes, or you might get no answer at all, and that's okay. You can just sit with the question, what brings me here today? And just know that together in this space that we're creating, even though we're not physically in the same room, we can psychically share this space of acceptance and non-judgmentalness and curiosity and camaraderie and compassion for each other on this journey. And so whenever you're ready, you can open your eyes. Thank you so much for doing that. I'd like to now uh, more formally introduce our featured speaker here, uh, Dr. David Ballard. David is a psychologist and licensed marriage and family counselor. 
He's been in, he's been practicing individual psychotherapy and couples therapy in San Francisco now for over 30 years. I'm uh, smiling because it's, hate to admit it, but over 40 years now. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> yes, no. Okay, great. Gotta update your website bio. Huh. He's a clinical professor of medicine and clinical professor of medical psychology at UCSF, where he's been affiliated with the Human Sexuality Program and the Behavioral Medicine Unit. He's hosted international symposia on sexuality and medical conditions and taught courses to medical students, nurses, interns, residents, faculty, therapists, other health healthcare providers, as well as our patients. Um, he currently consults with the Symptom Management Service at the UCSF Helen Diller Family Comprehensive Cancer Center and is a member of the Professional Advisory Group of the Spiritual Care Services Clinical Pastoral Education Program at UCSF. David is a guest teacher at the San Francisco Zen Center, City Center, and Green Gulch. David's practice and teaching have been supported and deepened by exploring Bhutan. Is that, did I pronounce that correctly? Bhutan with Dr. Yeah. Robert. Thurman. Up next to Nepal in the Himalaya. Oh, okay. Um, and by advanced training in trauma therapy, somatic experiencing in Brazil with Dr. Peter Levine, and enjoying time in the West of Ireland with David White and others in celebration of poetry of the human soul. That sounds so lovely. So welcome. We're, I'm so delighted that you're here with us today, David. And I just, you'll all see that he's just such a lovely human being and um, kind of our resident expert at UCSF in helping couples and helping us learn about um, couples going through illness together. So thanks so much, David. Um, I'm gonna go over here now and let's see, advance the slide here. Should I jump in? Sure, you can jump in. I'm going to oh, share. Okay. So uh, right now, um, I've only done a couple of these Zoom things, but I'm eager to see how this one works out. And is there something you could tell people, Naomi, about whether they, if they have a question or the raise hand thing? Yes. Maybe that yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, we're really wanting this to be a dialogue as much as possible. So for those of you who are joining us live, we invite you to ask a question um, throughout. We'll be monitoring the Q&A. So you can ask a question anonymously uh, via the Q&A function. You can type in your question or you might see on your screen there, there's a raise your hand. And if you uh, raise your hands, then we will unmute you and you can ask your question or make your comment verbally. And we'll just call your name and we'll let you know that we're uh, ready to hear your question. So um, yeah, and, and then at the end, we're gonna stop the recording and we're gonna allow all of you who are joining us live to just um, to come kind of in front of the curtain like we are here and we can just say hello and continue any part of the discussion that you wish to have with us. It would not be recorded. Not recorded, yes. No. Good. Okay, well let me jump in for a minute with understanding that all of you who are watching this have been touched by cancer and more particularly probably have been touched in your lives by brain cancer. And um, it's a very special journey and experience. I have a dear friend who died three years ago in March of a glioblastoma that he battled for quite a while. And I know there's a lot of brain cancers that are treatable and people are able to continue. But I thought I'd, uh, for me, I thought it would be interesting to share with you a couple of things that have given me um, a sense of awe lately that I like to think about, and I'll just put that out there before we get, begin. The first is um, just about five years ago, I think, they discovered through the Hubble telescopes and large array telescopes around the world that the universe was actually much bigger than they had previously thought. So do you have any, do you have any figure in your mind of how many stars they, estimate right now there are throughout all of the universe. I had to look it up just before, just about an hour ago, just to be sure. 
the number is 70 billion trillion. <laughs> and we only have this one star that we look at, at. And, you know, if you're like me, most of the time I go about my business and I, I don't look at the sun and think, wow, that's only one out of 70 billion trillion. The numbers are way beyond um, our ability, but it does stretch your brain a bit, doesn't it? The other thing that has been giving me awe lately is uh, a friend of mine, dear friend, got me to a website called um, Wait Not Why. Uh, I'll give you that information later. And he makes a point about our ancestors. So think of this for a minute. Most of us, probably all of us, there may be a, a way this can be done without it, but each of us had a father. And each of our fathers had a father, right? And if you take it back, um, I want to use the actual figures. Your great-great-grandfather probably lived between 1825 and 1875. And then your, um, if you count the greats and you go back 20, 20 greats, that might be in the 1300s. And if you go back to 11,000 BC, and I was recently in Egypt, which was great, you have a great 550, you know, think of all those stacked up fathers. And if you go back to the kind of the beginning of uh, the modern Homo sapiens, it's uh, great with 500 going back. And he takes it back all the way to um, 580 million years ago because we all came from some single cell organisms. And if you count it that way, it's um, that great with all them stacked up, it's a great 435 million. So we've all descended from all these incredible chain of life forms giving their DNA. And if any of them had been different, we wouldn't be here. Hmm. So anyway, that's just hmm. one thing I've, I've been thinking about. Um, just a little bit of background. In 1976, we had a federal grant. And if any of you are older than me, I kind of doubt it these days, I'm 74, but I want to thank you for your tax dollars because back then in 1976, we had a six year grant to train physically disabled people to be sex educators and counselors for others. And our first training group of nine people, seven of them used wheelchairs. They had spinal cord injuries or cerebral palsy, multiple sclerosis, rheumatoid arthritis, spina bifida, and it was really amazing because we, the trainers, learned a lot more from them, I think, than they learned from us. Because each one as an individual had to learn to be able to think of themselves and appreciate that they were sexual beings, even when their body shape or their body's ability to do things was completely the opposite of what you'd see on the movie screens, because they just didn't have disabled people in romantic roles or sexual roles or that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So after learning about that and what became known as sex therapy in the 1970s, which Masters and Johnson started, I worked with a lot of people in that realm. And that really got me interested in how couples talk with each other, because an awful lot of issues of intimacy are just simply how to talk with each other. And we'll get in a little bit later to the nonverbal communication that's, that's so important as well. So my career in being able to be in a room with people, including um, two people or three or four, if it was a whole family who weren't getting along, has really educated me much more than theories or schooling. Just learning from the people I worked with has been a, a great value to me. And I hope that we're gonna be able to share in the things that 
will be helpful to you in perhaps engaging in deeper conversations or more conversations to help get you through difficult times. Um, Thank you so much. Yeah, I mean, you're kind of reminding me in all of this, um, kind of our, you know, kind of our part in this bigger picture and that also we're all just human beings. You know, there's something very, just very basic, no matter the experiences we've gone through and the, the trauma, the difficulties, the changes, it's like it, you can kind of boil it down to some very simple, you know, human factors. And I know every time you speak, I, I learn so much in my life and uh, with all my relationships. So, um, so thank you so much. Shall I start the slide? Yeah, so, and let's acknowledge that in the beginning, let's talk in kind of generic, general ways about how people might find ways of talking that are deeper or even being able to talk to repair something that had happened between the two of them, whether it's just feeling distant from one another or actually recovering from a fight or an argument. I was thinking of writing a book a while back and then I thought there are just too many books out there. <laughs> I love the word infobesity, which means um, there's so much information and we have the internet. And so rather than write a book, I tried to distill what I'd been taught learned from people over the years into one page about seven bullet points and so we'll go through that and then very particular ones that relate to the experience of having brain cancer or having a partner with brain cancer or a family member or someone you're a caregiver for so uh, we'll try and keep all of that in mind so if you'd like to start that'd be great Okay, I'm hearing a little bit of um, sound. I don't know if it's from your mic, David, but I can hear you. It just uh, was bump, sounded like it was bumping against something, but uh, okay. we'll start. I can hear you now. Okay, all right. So these were from an article that you've written, recently written and some ideas that you had. So the first was respect each other's feelings. And maybe I'll just read it out before yeah. you kind of comment on it. Uh, focus the conversation on how your partner's actions or words make you feel rather than on criticizing them or trying to change their behavior. Your relationship should be a safe place where each of you is able to express your feelings without judgment. Yeah, it seemed to me that I learned that people can argue, but they can't they're usually arguing about ideas or beliefs or decisions, but you can't really argue with a feeling, with your own feeling or someone else's. I, I like to think of it as, for example, if I told you, wow, my knee really hurts because when I came into my room here, I hit my knee against the door and it's really hurting right now. You can't argue with me about that. I, I don't think you'd even think of arguing to argue, you'd have to say, no, David, I don't think it really hurts that much. <laughs> it's the same way for physical sensations as it is for feelings. If I feel something, for me, it's a temporary fact. The good news is it's temporary because we all know we go through lots of different feelings over a, a day. Am I echoing or not for no, you? you're good, yeah. Okay, because I took one of my hearing aids out. I thought maybe that was uh, <laughs> causing something, but so that I like is um, if people find that they're disagreeing, they should ask themselves, can I hear the truth in what the other person is saying? Because even if my, like when my son was five years old, if he said, you're a mean dad, you're the meanest dad in the world, I don't want to go to bed right now. Um, the truth in what he's saying is not really about me, is it? I think we'd all understand whether we have kids or not, that, wow, that little five-year-old didn't want to go to bed and he's kind of angry and upset and name-calling. And I understand that the truth is he's really feeling upset. He really wants to stay up. What I do about that is separate. It's, I can be compassionate. I understand, Mike. I, he, I know it's no fun to go to bed 
when you think other people are staying up. But you know, you're five years old and you're going to bed. So I can separate out the behavior or the idea from the feeling and be compassionate with the feeling without having to be compliant with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I was thinking for people who have, you know, who are going through um, brain cancer, um, it might be helpful here in terms of respecting their, their care partner's feelings in just um, kind of a certain awareness that even though it's within, it's not in their body, they're not experiencing the cancer, but they're still going through their own adjustments, you know, their own changes and their own, um, their own adjustments to that person's changes that might be, you know, fairly impacted either cognitively or behavior or their energy or, or, or role changes as well. So it's an adjustment for the care partner as well. Yeah, and that brings up uh, a good point Thank you that I've been, I mean, probably all of us have been in a situation where we, we sort of thought, oh, this person I'm really close to is really suffering or going through a hard time. I shouldn't talk about my feelings. Mm -hmm. But you can take turns. And a lot of times I think whether it's a caregiver or a family member, they have a right to their feelings too. And finding a way, a safe place that you can discuss these things with each other. I think it helps everybody feel more authentic and real and they know they're on the same page. Mm -hmm. Not all the time, but at least some of the time. Yeah, great. Okay, I'll, shall I move on to, all right. The next point, um, get to the root of your relationship to stress irritation, annoyance, or frustration towards your partner may actually be symptoms of deeper, more painful emotions. When you identify and acknowledge the pain, sadness, or fear beneath the surface, you will be better able to resolve the relationship to stress that results from it. That's one of my very favorite things. It's helped me in my life an awful lot to know that anger, irritation, annoyance, frustration, that I see in somebody else that make me want to react to it in a negative way. Uh, it's really, I'm seeing something that's secondary, something that's a result of deeper feelings, which that second paragraph talks about. And usually those are the vulnerable feelings of sadness or fear or pain of some sort. And the anger makes us pull back if we only see it as anger, but if we can see deeper into it and see the vulnerable, the fear underneath it, that pulls us closer. That makes us want to understand better. But for many people, the, their own fear of being misunderstood or through makes, makes them perhaps withhold small irritations or anger and they, they swallow it or keep it inside and sometimes it's better to let it out when it's small uh -huh. and just share it with the other person, especially if the other person understands that one of the most important things you can do when you hear someone else's feeling is just to deeply hear it and not have to do anything. I'm not sure at the moment if this, the other slides get into this, but it seems to me that we often want to explain things to someone else so that they, they won't feel what they feel. Mm -hmm. uh, but that explanation usually makes them feel worse that somehow you don't want them, that you don't want to hear what they're feeling. And it's much better to, uh, I guess the, the metaphor that I like a lot is, you know, they, from maybe high school physics, there's a tuning fork that's, mm -hmm going at a certain frequency and you put another one next to it after a while they resonate. Mm. I like the idea. I know for me, it feels really good. If I express how I feel good or bad, it's great if that other person just hears it and lets me know in their language that they, they get what I'm saying. They're not judging it. They're not explaining to me why I shouldn't feel that way. They're just joining me in a way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and when I, I would look at this image here of the princess and the pea, and you know, um, the pea kind of being what's really kind of underlying everything. 
sometimes I, I think for those who have a brain cancer diagnosis, the P is actually the cancer itself. Like the, the cancer is, um, or the treatment or the effect of the, of the treatment is, is causing some real changes in their moods and their energy level. Um, maybe their, their reaction to stimuli, you know, they, they feel kind of qualitatively different inside. And, um, I heard a, a survivor, he wrote a beautiful poem, and part of the poem was uh, really imploring the idea that it's not your fault. Like to kind of, just to kind of, for the, for the patient to know this isn't your fault. You did not ask for this cancer. You did not ask for all these changes. You know, you did not, you did not bring this on. This happened to you. You know, it happened to you as a couple as well, but it, and, and because I think that sometimes there's a lot of um, maybe feelings of shame that come up with uh, like I'm different and I'm not the person I used to be. But I think, you know, just to kind of settle into to knowing that it's not your fault. This is something that's not of your doing. Mm -hmm. That was so well expressed. I'm so glad you brought that up because it reminds me of the title of one of my favorite books. Uh, somebody I've never met, but he's a, a Bay Area, San Francisco guy who teaches at places like Spirit Rock. And his name is Wes Nisker, N-I-S-K-E-R. And I love the title of his book, You Are Not Your Fault. Oh. And he just points out so many things. We didn't select our DNA. We didn't select our parents. We didn't select early childhood experiences. We barely select adult experiences and things like our our health is something we don't get a chance to choose that much so i really uh, appreciate that yeah point of view i just wanted to pause for a moment to see if anybody had any questions or comment as or questions go. or comments um and we'll just keep an eye on that if if you do want to speak uh, anytime anytime yeah <laughs> but we'll move on Okay, the next point, take your partner's feelings seriously, but not personally. When your partner is upset or frustrated, try not to react defensively. Instead, hear them out, acknowledge their feelings, and ask how you can help. It's beautiful. There's a wonderful Vietnamese Zen Buddhist teacher named Thich Nhat Hanh, who just has done wonderful things. He's quite elderly now and he's recovering where he's, he had a very terrible stroke, was treated here in San Francisco for a while. But he was interviewed with uh, Oprah and I had never really watched Oprah much, but she did a magnificent interview with him. He's pretty much the guy who brought the word mindfulness to Western culture and that was taken up by John Kabat-Zinn in this little interchange that you can find on YouTube, it's called The Four Mantras. And if you put Oprah, O-P-R-A-H, and you don't have to spell his whole name, T-H-I-C-H would probably be enough. And The Four Mantras. At the last mantra is the one that really uh, was so wonderful to hear because the first one is about saying to your to someone you care about, whether it's a spouse or a friend or, or a cat, anybody, how much you are there for them. And that's the greatest gift we can give anyone is being present with them. And the second one is letting them know that you see that they are present for you and what a gift that is. And the third is when you say, you understand that your partner or this other person is upset with you and you really see that and you're with them. The one that <laughs> kind of knocked my socks off is when he said the fourth one, which is, uh, I am upset with you. Please help me. We often think of, or I do at least, of arguments and I'm, I'm upset with you and it's, it's sort of a pushing you away. And to instead say, please help me, was just a wonderful thing. I, I couldn't repeat it 
nearly as well as he did. So I, I recommend you look at that. Not that we in the West can talk to each other that way, but it gave a, a really lovely example of not being defensive. And I know when I've told couples this, try to hear the other person's feelings and don't take it personally, take it seriously. They look at me and they say, how can I not take his or her feelings personally? Well, the answer is because you heard some words that came out of that person's mouth, that came out of their brain, right? And it's their feelings. That's what you're trying to hear. And it's back to that idea of your job is to hear the truth in what they're saying. And if they're really upset with you, if my partner calls me lazy for not doing something, the truth is she's upset about something. And the more I can look at it that way, I think really helps for all of us to feel heard and understood. Yeah. yeah. That's great. And I love the picture of the birds. It looks like <laughs> one is really deeply listening and the other is uh, squawking a little bit, maybe. <laughs> Thank but you. this is a great Thank point, you. I think. It is so hard, I think, sometimes to not get kind of, to jump into that struggle. Um, when you feel like that you're the reason that someone's upset and you're needing to defend yourself against being that reason. Mm -hmm. um, and I know sometimes with, you know, I've seen couples when, when, when someone is dealing with memory issues, you know, as a lot of our patients do, um, they have memory issues and there's this kind of need to kind of prove themselves that, you know, to prove that their memory was correct. They're right. You know, that, that yeah. yeah. And, um, and we and, and they or a lot of people get tired of being reminded that they didn't remember something exactly. Yeah. That's hard. Yes. Right. Yeah. Yeah, but this is such a great point. Okay, I'll move on to the next point. Here we go. All right. Oh, and this kind of relates to what we were just talking about. Mm -hmm. Choose choose being kind over being right. When conflict occurs, accept your part of the responsibility ra rather than engaging in fault finding. I, I like to, uh, in about 15 years ago, I was on this trip with a Tibetan Buddhist scholar, Robert Thurman, who was at Columbia University. And he used some language that I hadn't heard, but it, it really fit what my experience had been over the years of working with couples. And his idea was that there's no absolute self. There's not a David. There's only the David that people who encounter me uh, get, get to see. So the, those of you, Naomi, you know me more than Alexa. And Alexa, you know me more than the people who are watching this program. But even in my own life, my son knows me differently than my daughter knows me. We're, we're different with different people, and we're different from moment to moment. So mm -hmm. some of what you see in your partner, imagine coming home and seeing a family member or a friend, and you immediately launch into a criticism of something they did. Mm -hmm. They're going to be probably react one way. Versus if you come home and you just say some compliment. So we all influence each other. It's a just, just another way of saying we're part of a system. A relationship is a cybernetic interactive system. And what we put into the system sometimes is influences greatly what we get back from the system. Mm -hmm. And it's good to recognize that we're both part of the system it's my fault. If we're having trouble communicating or having an upset between us, it's my fault 50%. And it's the other person's fault 50%, which means 50 and 50, they cancel out. And blame becomes a pretty much of an illusion and something that you just doesn't often help. This issue of being that if you're struggling with who's right and who's wrong, which most arguments tend to be about, you're, you're missing the point because mm -hmm. there's not one single thing between the two of you that's right. There are two things that mm -hmm. I think are most important that we share with each other, and that's your feelings. 
Yeah. And you're, you have every right to feel in the moment what you feel, even if it's based on wrong information. And your other, the other person has a right to feel what they feel. We, uh -huh. we just do. We don't know. I don't think we always choose our feelings. They come about based on circumstance. Yeah. Do you have any thoughts about how, if someone finds that they're feeling that they're getting blamed, you know, from their partner, you didn't, you didn't remember to do this, or you're, you're being too talkative, you're not, you know, or you're behaving in a way that's erratic, or, you know, so the person's feeling blamed. Um, is there something that that person could do in that moment to kind of shift it so it's... I think there, there are two things. Um, and again, I like to think of it as a system. Yeah. So for each of us in a relationship, it's important to have what the Buddhists call right speech. Mm -hmm. So rather than you're, you're lazy, you're being this, you're, you're, not, um, you're not helping me, that's a blaming accusation. Mm -hmm. It's better if you can probably identify and then share what you feel. I feel left out. I feel scared. I, I don't feel important. It made me feel bad that you did that. Mm -hmm. So that's speaking the right way. But of course, none of us can always speak the right way. But mm -hmm. the other half of it is right listening. Mm -hmm. So even if the person is accusing you of something in that moment or letting off steam by, by saying something that sounds accusatory or critical or blaming, Mm -hmm. Your job is also to listen underneath it, like that previous slide said, to try, wow, you're, I know you're really upset with me right at the moment. I think I see what's underneath your frustration. It's so hard for you sometimes, mm -hmm. whether you're the caregiver or it's me who's going through the treatment. Mm -hmm. It's just hard for both of us. Yeah. And neither of us has uh, a real monopoly on that. We all have hurt feelings and left out feelings and ch feelings that are challenging. The good news about feelings my experience is if we can share them and get them heard where they're not being argued with or not being judged or told I shouldn't feel that way, I should feel something else. If I just get heard, <sighs> mm -hmm. I get to relax a little bit. Yeah. And somebody knows. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. I just was on a call earlier with my coaching group. I'm doing a kind of a coaching um, training right now. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that we just talked about was this powerful listening. And before asking a question or making some other kind of statement, you, you try to get to the yes. So it's like, really so that person really understands that you get them so i'm hearing you're feeling really frustrated i'm hearing that you're feeling so overwhelmed with all the things that we need to do or you know and then you hear a yes you know yes and then you can kind of go less you know that's a beautiful way to put it yeah yeah and it's like it's like you're saying you're when you're listening you're you're listening for the humanity under the words almost like you're listening for the what it's like to be that other person what it's like to be that other person yeah. i have a pet peeve when people say <clears throat> to each other or to another yeah i understand you can say I, I, if you asked me uh, alexa or now if you asked me david do you know russian i can say oh yes i understand russian it doesn't mean i understand russian at all so trying to use your, as you put it, use your own words to try to do a portrait of what you think the other person is feeling, what they told you, but maybe also what you intuit, what they're feeling um, in your own words. And then if you get that yes, you know that then it's probably they're going to be much more. I know if, if I feel heard, I'm much more open it's automatic i want to hear how the other person feels yeah. uh a guy um stephen covey who wrote a book called seven habits of highly effective people many years ago it was a business oriented book but it was really good and he said it usually goes like this please understand me and the other person says no understand me and the first one says you're not hearing me the second one says well you don't want to hear me well you never did want to hear me well, 
and then it goes off track. So the first thing you try to do is first seek to understand the other. And if that person feels understood, they're going to be much more open to hearing your side of it. And there are mm -hmm. those two sides of it. Yeah. 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 And again, I think I just want to reiterate again, like this whole idea that, that both of you are going through a, a, with brain cancer, both of you are going through a big change and both of you are going through a big adjustment and uh, to bring in kind of compassion for each other in that, because that's probably somewhere where you can both really connect with like, this is a big deal. You know? Yeah. So, okay. I'll move on to the next slide. Um, Find simple ways to reconnect. In a relationship, it's important to feel safe, cared for, and deeply understood. During difficult or uncertain times, find simple ways to reconnect with your partner, a gentle touch on the shoulder, a caring smile, a hug, or comforting words. There's amazing, sad, I guess, re research about how little time people, whether they're you know, roommates or spouses or partners or family members, how little time they really spend looking at each other and just talking about how they're feeling. Because it's so easy to get into, if I come home and my partner Linda says, uh, how was your day? And I tell her a bunch of stories about things that, um, not about clients, but just about what my day was like she's not even involved. She's just an audience member. I could be talking to the wall. Or if I get home and she says, how are you? I say, fine, how are you? And she says, oh, fine. We haven't really communicated. It's, it's great to take a little time. I've also run across some really important work that's been done about couples, the nonverbal, mm -hmm. the importance of touch, as, as this one was just even a touch on the shoulder. Um, a look and when it comes to hugs this is my favorite one there's actually supposedly I mean I, I don't know the actual research but I pretend like I do is that when you hug someone in the beginning of a hug there's a kind of muscle tension you know you're doing that but if you can hold on a little bit longer eventually you get to a almost like a yawn when it really uh, completes itself. If you can just hold on that long, the nervous system for both people gets quieter and calms mm -hmm. down. It's a good thing to do. Longer hugs. Mm. I love that. It's something simple, nonverbal. It's you can do it if you're tired or anytime. And as I was thinking about this point too, I was also thinking, um, again, sometimes for people who have gone through such a, a big change and this um, kind of loss and mourning of kind of the relationship that was, that maybe in reconnecting, it might be helpful to do something new together rather than trying to do something that, you know, was something they used to do before brain cancer came into their lives, that maybe kind of a, a recreating of their relationship by you know, maybe going, picking up kayaking together, going to a new restaurant together, trying a new kind of food together, um, something, something new in this kind of reformed connection. Yeah, it's a good point because we know that novelty in our brains is something that we're, evolution has made us really want to tune into new things and novelty. Mm -hmm. Putting that together, I'd also add getting out in nature. Mm -hmm. I, I picked up a book uh, a couple months ago, a Japanese book, and the title of it was Forest Bathing. Oh, yeah. And they have a concept that just walking through beautiful places, and there's some research on it too, that it makes endorphins. Just, it's such a powerful thing for human beings to be in nature. So going going to Golden Gate Park, going to a place that I know I've lived here for a long time and uh, I can't, it, we, we go to s some of those kinds of places and it's pretty hard to, to not enjoy on a beautiful day walking through the, seeing the trees and the green and the blue sky and maybe the clouds. Mm -hmm. It does something very deep for human beings. Yeah, yeah, wonderful. 
I'm Two trying thoughts. to figure out which slide I want to share. I always like to share my favorite story about the Dalai Lama. So mm -hmm. I'm trying to figure out where I can put it. You have in. Um, Sorry. three more slides. <laughs> so. Let's see what's next. Okay. Should we take a moment to pause again to see if anybody has any questions or want to raise their hand? Sure. I, have to, I have to switch my screen around a little bit um, to see if the to see the participants, if anybody has their hand up or anything. I just want to say I really do like this point a lot. I think that even in my own life, we're on autopilot all day. And when you get home, there is such a little time, energy, mental capacity to have a real deep, meaningful conversation with your significant other. And finding a simple way to connect, um, whether it be nonverbal, holding hands, or giving the opportunity to connect without even saying anything, I think is so special and really can help foster um, a beautiful relationship. Yeah. Um, yeah, we take, we take relationships for granted. Just like what I said in the very beginning, um, we take life for granted. Now that's where people who have brain cancer or any kind of cancer or any kind of scary or difficult medical challenging condition have been woken up to something that we should all be woken up to, which is this preciousness of this life. I have a dear friend who made a videotape uh, about eight and a half minutes, and Naomi, I was, I'll send it to you, and if people watching this would like to see it, they can contact you and get it, because it's, uh, it's on, uh, it's on the internet and it's out there. And about two weeks after she put it out there, it had 11,000 hits. And she's wow. a lovely person. And what she did in her video was to say, I've got some bad news and I have some good news. The bad news is that my, and she says it much, obviously much more eloquently, but I'll give you the gist of it. The doctors that were treating my cancer decided that the treatment was no longer doing anything. So we decided to stop all the treatment. The good news is, since I've stopped treatment, I've been feeling much better. And knowing that that's no longer an option, I'm accepting that. And I'm not trying to figure out how much time I might have left. I'm just living and enjoying every moment. And I invite all of you who are watching this video to be reminded of this present moment, of what a special thing it is. Mm -hmm. And this is David speaking now. It was, it's really inspiring to hear anything about the present moment. So now I get to say the Dalai Lama story very quickly, and then we'll get to this awkwardness thing, which is something else I love. So the Dalai Lama in 1984, and I can't say I'm a Buddhist or have any religious background particularly, but I have learned um, to appreciate some of their ideas from many spiritual disciplines. But back to the Dalai Lama, he was in India and in standing by a window talking to a woman journalist about the terrible events that had taken place in his country, the destruction of thousands of temples, the murders and imprisonment and torture of many of his countrymen. And he had such sadness, such grief, such a depth of how terrible all of that was for him. Then he looked out the window at a tree. And when he looked back at her, she said, his eyes were full of bliss. And he said, life is so very colorful, isn't it? And what I like about that story is it reminds all of us that we can get into the depths of sadness or fear or discouragement or just feel terrible. And sometimes it's a story in our head that's making us feel that way. Mm -hmm. Something we'd heard on the news or political stuff or, or worries about our own health. But then we get back into what's happening right at this present moment. I'm sitting here and I'm with this person or I'm in this place and I have a roof over my head and I'm warm 
and appreciating the present moment is it's become almost trite because they even use mindfulness in commercials, things like that. But it's really a wonderful thing, a wonderful refuge to get back to the present moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. That's a beautiful story and a good reminder. Okay. I'll, I'll move on to the next slide here. Um, Awkward. Awkwardness. <laughs> Embrace the awkwardness. Uh -huh. Especially for couples. Let's see. Yeah. Oh, this is getting into more about touch and maybe even sexuality. Um, yeah. Reestablishing intimate touch may feel a little awkward at first after the interruption of cancer and its treatment. This awkwardness is perfectly normal. Instead of looking at it as a problem, embrace it. Remember to laugh, be patient with each other and keep practicing intimacy. Eventually the awkwardness will subside. So I like to think of uh, how useful it is to expand your idea of what sexuality is or what intimacy is. And that goes back to when I mentioned early on the, the great gift I had of being able to learn from people who are physically disabled, how they became able to embrace the idea that they were still sexual beings, even if oh, he had awesome. a spinal cord injury and was quadriplegic and couldn't feel anything from the chest down, that he or she would still be a sexual being, that you don't have to prove it by doing anything with anybody it's more how we feel about ourselves and part of being a, an alive human being. Mm -hmm. And so when we talk about intimacy and sexuality, the, you know, it may be more intimate and even sexual in a way to sit in front of a fireplace and just hold hands and just feel the skin contact of this other person that's important to you. Mm -hmm. And for couples or individuals who've had their, uh, their sex life interrupted. There's a great quote we're going to use at the end of this that to me sums up the human dilemma when it comes to sexuality. But often if there's been quite a break, I've seen so many couples who hadn't been able to regain sexual intimacy, not because of cancer, but just because that's how life goes for many people how important it is to break the ice just by small steps of mm -hmm. reaching out and touching in a different way that embracing the awkwardness means don't buy into the Hollywood movie model in our heads of things have to be just terrific mm -hmm. because if you, if you hadn't, if there's anything you hadn't done for quite a while, you wouldn't expect to, have it go great necessarily the first time. So that's where that idea comes from. Yeah. Yeah. And when I, when I read this too, the, the title Embrace the Awkwardness, I also think that it not just um, around sexuality and intimate touch, but kind of the whole gamut of, of one's life after. Even, even communication. Yeah. Commun communicating. It's hard. And, and that's a great way to start off sometimes. Like I've got something I want to talk about. Um, and I'm really anxious. I'm afraid that you're going to be hurt by it, or I'm afraid that you're not going to understand, or I'm, I'm afraid it's going to make you um, react in some way. It's awkward for me to do this, but I want to talk about something that we haven't talked about before. Mm -hmm. And again, I love the pictures that you chose to illustrate this. This is looks like a stork or something with a, uh, I'm kind sure of it's an awkward place, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And the next slide is is kind of I think you alluded to it already. The um, oh, prioritize intimacy. Maybe this is different. And again, intimacy, and I'll let you read that one too. Oh yeah. Most married couples do not make as much time for sexual intimacy as they would like, and cancer can make it even more difficult to find the time. Set aside some time each day to share your feelings with your partner instead of the usual rundown of your to do list. Even just 15 minutes of intimate conversation can make a difference. Yeah, and again, it's the quality of the conversation because we've all done this where, you know, how are you? I'm fine, how are you? I'm okay. No information. <laughs> we haven't really shared anything. Yeah. We've had people who might say that at the beginning of a meeting that we're having, they might say, oh, I'm okay. 
And I'll say, well, can you go a little deeper than that? And I think uh, not, I have to say, I think sometimes my experience, which is limited, sometimes men might have a little more difficulty labeling and identifying and talking about their feelings, especially if you ask them, what do you feel? Because often we feel many different feelings at the same time. So a better question is, can you, can you tell me the different ways that you feel? And mm -hmm. sometimes they're complete opposites and that's okay too. Mm -hmm. We've done that like, well, I'd, I'd like to go to the movies, but part of me wants to just stay home. I'm really tired. But if mm -hmm. you want to, I'd be happy to. Mm -hmm. Something like that. Yeah, right. That's great. And I like how you talk about intimacy here is is really about sharing feelings too it's not necessarily just about making time for you know physical intimacy it's just I, I, i've got it this might be a good place to give a, a very quick um i know a couples therapist up in seattle who does workshops and when you leave his workshop you have a, a, a loose leaf binder with about 300 exercises <laughs> homework exercises that therapists are supposed to give to people to do not all of them, but to do some of them. I've never found that useful. I, um, but I do have one homework exercise about communication that I like to suggest that people try. That is so simple. But most, I don't think I've had anybody say, oh yeah, we do that regularly. And it's, uh, I can tell you in about two minutes, I hope. It's called the disappointment appreciation exercise. Mm -hmm. So you set aside, it'll only take five minutes. And it's a way to just break the ice and get things started. So you and I, I, I would ask you to tell me three things that disappointed you over the last day or two. And they can be petty and minor and little, but they have to be behavioral and specific. You can't say, well, David, I didn't, I didn't like your attitude at the meeting this morning. Because uh, I might have had 12 attitudes at the meeting. I, I couldn't tell what you meant. But if you said, uh, when, you, when you walked out of the room, you shut the door before I could even get out. It's a moment in time when you were a little bit disappointed with me. In the old days, we used to call it the resentment appreciation exercise, but I think it's more accurate to call it the disappointment one. And each, you're gonna tell me three things that you didn't like that occurred between us. And um, I just say, thank you for each one after you say it. And then you say three things that you appreciated. Let's say we were office mates or something. And you, hey, I appreciated that. You, you took that wastebasket out yesterday. And I would again say thank you. And these are not major things. They can be very little. Or it could be major, more like, wow, David, I appreciated you gave me that birthday card for my birthday. I, I, I didn't even know you knew it was my birthday, but thank you. And then you switch. Okay, the, the fun part of, for me to explain about this, when you go, now it's me giving you feedback that we're office mates, right? And I have three things I didn't like, but I'm not allowed to have one of the disappointments that's anything like the one you did. So I can't say, well, you know, yesterday after that meeting, you left before I did, and you shut the door before I could get to it. Because that would be like being defensive or tit for tat sort of thing. Mm -hmm. But here's my, the best thing is um, the most fun thing to explain. Alexa, if you told me, you know, our, our office refrigerator, I put a piece of cheesecake in there with a toothpick and a sign on it saying, this was sent to me by my friend in New York for my favorite deli. It's, I'm gonna have it for my birthday tonight. Please leave it alone. Don't anybody eat it. And I came into work this morning, I opened up and there were just crumbs and you ate it and you, you were blaming me. In this exercise, you know what I have to say? If I didn't eat it, I have to say thank you. I just have to accept that I'm hearing your feelings. In real life terms, what would happen would be, you'd say, uh, I'm really upset with you. I can't believe that you ate that, that piece of cheesecake was mine. And I'd say, what, you're wrong. I didn't eat it. Why are you, why are you blaming me for things? 
I've never had an office mate tell me that before. That's, that's crazy. I would never do such a thing. So, but in this exercise, I would have to say thank you because it's a way to validate and let you know, I understand you're upset. You think you're upset because I ate the cheesecake which I know I didn't do, but the important thing is not cheesecake or who to blame or who did what. The important thing is the fact that you were hurt that someone, at the idea that someone would do such a thing. So that's my favorite little exercise. I don't know what any particular person would get from it, but it can be fun way to really connect at a deeper level when you're expressing a particular moment in time that you're either happy or in this case it's good to do the disappointments first mm -hmm. i like how structured it is like it's just very clear and straightforward and the yeah. Same. yeah yeah so thank you for that that's great okay i'll go to the next slide and i think you touched on this remember that you are <clears throat> a sexual being Regardless of whether you're sexually active, sexuality is part of who you are as a human being. And you had talked about that already, I think. Mm -hmm. um, remember. Yeah, your sexuality is not defined by what you do, how often you do it, or with whom. And most people, when it comes to sexuality, most people have had really ups and downs. Um, whether you've been sexually active with other people or not. And whether if you're single with brain cancer, that's a, with any kind of medical condition, that's tough. But it's also tough being single for people who don't have medical conditions. And then it's tough for people who have partners and don't have medical conditions or do. It's just life has its suffering moments. Uh, I wonder if it'd be useful to do that final quote now and then this is what I used to teach uh, a class to medical students second year medical students and this is the favorite quote that I think summed up how we felt I think I'll just read it out loud sex is a problem for everyone indeed for a couple of weeks or a couple of months or maybe even for a couple of years if we are lucky we may feel that we've solved the problem of sex but then, of course, we change, or our partners change, or the whole ballgame changes. And once again, we're left trying to scramble over that obstacle with this built-in feeling that we can get over it, when actually we never can. However, in the process of trying to get over it, we learn a great deal about vulnerability and intimacy and love. And to me, that's, that's the, if there has to be, there has to be moving forward from suffering and adversity and difficult times. And one beautiful way to move forward is to be able to share and be able to get known by somebody else and have the wonderful feeling that we are cared for. Mm -hmm. And that goes way beyond the pleasure of sex and needing to prove ourselves sexually. It's really about being cared for. Mm -hmm. And it prompts uh, conversations that otherwise people may not get to. Yeah, that's beautiful. Thank you. And I, I love that you brought in this idea of vulnerability because it's true. You know, it's like there's so much of kind of like opening the kimono kind of, um, when, when we deal with relationships and our feelings um, and what scares us. What's um, what makes us feel, you know, feel all those difficult emotions, sorrow, grief, fear. Um, and we can, when we can do that with another person um, and or even just trying to do that with another person is such a beautiful thing. Yeah. Sure. yeah. Being vulnerable. Yeah. The, the power. Um, people talk about the, the liberation when you let yourself be vulnerable. Alexa, I think have you got I think you had collected some questions or that might pertain more directly to brain cancer that maybe up to this point we've covered the easy stuff. <laughs> and I'm sure for anybody who's listening to this who's partner or family member or person they're caring for, or especially if they have had treatment and gone through all of this, it's you're the experts and we're not, but we'll we'll try and talk about some of these things. 
So, oh, good, we, we, have, we might have some. Any kind of question, we can't guarantee we'll have any answers for, but we'll be happy to discuss with you. And it might be, any question would be helpful to the pe other people listening. Yeah, and if any of you, again, want to type in a question or if you want to ask a question live, you can raise your hand. And we'll continue this recorded conversation for maybe five more minutes and then we'll open it up and we'll stop recording. And, and if you want to talk casually and informally, we'd love, to, love for you to stay on. I had a question here. Um, what's helpful when I want to make time for intimate conversation, but my partner does not? Okay, well, let's say he's, he or she, the partner is really hardcore, not wanting to talk about stuff. And there are people, I, I'm sure we've all come across or can imagine people who their only experience with deep talking is when they've gotten into trouble. <laughs> like, uh, we really need to talk, and which may telegraph to them that you're upset with them. And they may have difficulty in, in wanting to hear that. So I think I would first step want to say, this is really important to me. Could we try talking more about our deeper feelings, even for five minutes? Could, could we try that? And let's say this per the other person's really hardcore and they say, no, we've talked enough. Uh, I, don't, I don't really want to do that. Or you know me, you know me, I don't do that sort of thing. Then the second step might be, okay, I, I'm going to accept that for now. But can I ask one question? Would you be willing to tell me what would be a negative outcome if we did talk a little bit? If we spent five or 10 minutes trying to share just what it's like, I want you to know what it's like to be me, and I want to know what's, what's it really like to be you right mm -hmm. now. In all of oh, we've lost your audio again. <laughs> I don't know what happened. But... Can you hear me now? Yeah, no, I can hear you. Okay, I don't know how much of that came through. Talk about getting a partner who won't talk with you and you, you <laughs> Voice, so I'm sorry about that. So the point was step one, really try to let the person know how important it is to you and you just want to try 10 minutes of deeper exploring your feelings. And secondly, if he still or she says, no, I can't for whatever reason, try to ask them, what, what are you afraid would be the outcome? What, what is a possible reason why you're are you trying to protect us from something are you afraid we get more yeah i think we might love i've lost your audio for the last bit but it sounds like you're, you're again you're really trying to get at the underlying feeling with not wanting to talk what's going on there yeah sorry about that yeah thank you do, do you have a question alexa yeah, I, I, I had a question. Um, I guess, what would you uh, say is some good advice if you're experiencing lack of energy or have maybe some body image concerns, how to maybe improve your, you know, your confidence and your sexuality and how to make that a priority in your relationship and in your life? Yeah, and that's, of course, maybe exaggerated or uh, increased with any kind of, uh, whether it's surgery or chemo or any kind of treatment that you have, but it's also the same issues that we all have growing up in this culture where you're supposed to have certain kinds of bodies. And I would say maybe do what they used to suggest people doing of just start getting some touch going. I, I know people who quit hugging because of uh, maybe once they hugged and there was pain with that, or the idea that if we really hug, you'll expect more from me. Just set some small goals and small steps forward with hugging, or um, say maybe uh, 
foot massage or a back rub or something like that. Just try to acknowledge to each other that our bodies have so much they can give us that, that feel good, not just sexual or genital feelings, but even just being held, touched, stroked, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Small steps in that direction. Thinking about that first part, worry about body concerns. Um, maybe should, should mention that. You know, I'm a little bit sad. And use some covering if you need to as a first step to, to do that. See what your partner says. I, 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 an overall sense that I have is that uh, we all, if we're in a relationship, and we're all in many different kinds of relationships, but it could be a relationship with a friend or a spouse or a partner or family member, any kind of relationship or intimacy is going to mean disappointments because it's just the way the way life is and we can get better at recovering from them and talking with each other to reconnect that's really great advice thank you so much yeah thank you so i think maybe um i'll move on because it is about that time uh, and then again, you can stay on afterwards if you'd like to continue to ask questions and discuss. So thank you all so much for being here and for being part of this webinar. Uh, we really want to hear from you how it went. There's going to be a survey at the end. We'd love for you to fill it out and let us know what we can do better, what you'd like to hear more of. We really want to partner with you in this development as we continue to grow our survivorship program. Feel free to stay on afterwards and our next webinar will be on March 18th, same time, 530. It's a Wednesday and we're going to be hearing from Dr. Christina Weyer-Jamora, who's our neuropsychologist. Um, she's going to be talking about strategies for health. So talking about issues around memory and focus and concentration, it, sh it should be really informative and interesting. So thank you again. Um, I look forward to seeing you again. I'm going to stop the recording and... Thanks, and all best wishes to you on your journeys.